Fox News host Tucker Carlson used the Freedom Convoy to fake his support for the working class. Now, I have a clip from this segment to show you. A lot of people, unfortunately, have been taken in by this idea that the Freedom Convoy is about standing up for the working class, when in fact it is not. I will get into that. But first, here is a clip from Tucker's segment. Watch what happens when actual workers, working people from working families who constitute the working class, actually come together as a group to protest how things are going. What happens then? Does the intellectual class greet these workers as heroes? Through a parade, listen intently to their stories? Does NPR do a sympathetic feature on them? Or do self-described progressives recoil in revulsion and horror at the grubbiness of the people who, as we used to say, work for a living? Do liberals immediately denounce them as Nazis and call for their suppression by force? That's the question. What's the answer? Well, ask Trump voters what happens. They'll know. Or consider what's happening right now in Canada. Thousands of truck drivers have descended on Ottawa, the capital city, to protest the tyranny of Justin Trudeau's government. Justin Trudeau does not like truck drivers. He thinks they're revolting. Justin Trudeau likes private equity barons and tech moguls and other people who give him money. All right, so this is a great example of what Tucker does to try and fake support for the working class. He will take certain things that a lot of people agree with, like Justin Trudeau is for private equity, is for, you know, capitalists, is for the wealthy. I agree with that. I criticize Trudeau constantly. If you go to my channel and search up Trudeau's name, you will see countless videos of me criticizing Justin Trudeau a lot more than Tucker ever has. But that doesn't mean that just because you agree with him on this, that this working, this, this uh, convoy is somehow a working class convoy of truckers. So let me get into how dishonest this is. First, quickly, just on... To put a, a pin on the, the Tucker point here, this is a great piece in Jacobin. I link to all my sources below the video on YouTube always, so you can check this out. Tucker Carlson, your boss's favorite populist, <laughs> they go on to write here, Tucker Carlson likes to style himself as a populist, but every time there's a fight over something that might actually make life easier for working class people, he never misses the opportunity to take the side of big business and the rich. And some examples here from their piece, after they break it down, they say, so let's review. Tucker Carlson's economic populism consists of fear-mongering about spending and the size of government, opposing the $15 an hour minimum wage, complaining about checks to unemployed people, ending an eviction pause out of concern for landlords, favoring wealthy homeowners' interests over the need for affordable housing, a total lack of concern over unionization and uh, extortionate medicine and healthcare costs, and an overwhelming obsession with a variety of culture war bugbears. So this is Tucker's so-called populism. He is not a fighter for the working class. He is, you know, of course, he's incredibly wealthy. He comes from a wealthy family. He's set to inherit a lot of money. But even apart from that, you can have somebody who's very wealthy and fighting for the working class. But Tucker does neither. He is incredibly wealthy, is, a, is very privileged, and also pretends to fight for the work class. He's smart enough to know how to play people. He does that better than anybody on television. But he plays to it while also at the same time not actually supporting the working class. So let me get into the actual convoy here, what it actually is. So first here, some uh, responses from some working class groups, people, organizations that represent truckers that are truckers that are made up of the working class. Teamsters Canada here with their statement on this. Teamsters is proud to represent over 55,000 professional drivers from diverse industries across the country, approximately 15,000 of which are long haul truck drivers, 90% of whom are vaccinated. The so-called Freedom Convoy and the despicable display of hate led by the political right and shamefully encouraged by elected conservative politicians does not reflect the values of Teamsters Canada, nor the vast majority of our members, and in fact has served to delegitimize the real concerns of most truck drivers today. And by the way, I will get to what those real concerns are that, of course, are being ignored by the convoy because, again, the convoy is not actually made up of working class truckers. But... More here, you also have the Canadian Trucking Alliance. They put out their statements saying they are uh, against this convoy. They do not support and strongly disapprove of any protests on public roadways, highways, and bridges. CTA believes such actions, especially those that interfere with public safety, are not how disagreements with government policy should be expressed. 
So they go on to, to basically say they are also against this convoy. But later on in an update, they also say this, while a number of Canadians are in Ottawa to voice their displeasure over this mandate, it also appears that a great number of these protesters have no connection to the trucking industry and have a separate agenda beyond a disagreement over cross-border vaccine requirements. As these protests unfold over the weekend, we ask the Canadian public to be aware that many of the people you see and hear in media reports do not have a connection to the trucking industry. So when the Canadian Trucking Alliance comes out and says, hey, this is not us, don't be fooled by these people, these are the actual truckers, it should give you pause to at least understand that maybe there are some people, I mean, definitely there's some people that are wrapped up in this that are, have been fooled by this, but there are a lot of people there who simply do not care at all about truckers and are simply there for their own agendas. More here. So this also gives you an idea how this is not about the working class, the vast majority of people are working class, while the vast majority of people are opposed to the convoy, with only 22% supporting it. So you can see the breakdown here, strongly support is at 12%, support is at 10%, oppose 20%, strongly oppose 47%, don't have clear views 11%. And there's also almost 9 in 10 think protesters have had an opportunity to make their point and should now leave town. This view is shared across demographic, regional, and political groups. Even 4 in 10 of those who support the convoy say it's time for them to leave the city. So you see here, the vast majority of people who are the working class are not in support of this so-called working class convoy. Next... This is where we get into who is behind this convoy, the organizers, their motivations. So a few pieces here. Again, there's a lot more information in the actual full pieces, but I'm not going to you know, go through all the data here. But I will link to it below the video in the description box on YouTube. But here, this is from Press Progress. Anti-vax convoy organizers previously targeted picketing oil refinery workers in Alberta. Yeah, a very pro-working class convoy here that targeted actual picketers, actual union members, actual working class workers uh, a couple of years ago. And so the exact same uh, organizers behind that are behind this. So here they reference um, James Botter, uh, who created Canada Unity, the group behind the Freedom Convoy that has shut down Canada's national capital. Botter has also authored the group's rambling memorandum of understanding, which calls for, de for deposing Canada's elected government. Two years ago, Botter was part of a similar far-right convoy that mobbed a picket line and threatened to run over locked-out oil refinery workers. Yeah, real working-class guy here. You also have these members, so in addition to Botter, other Freedom Convoy organizers such as Pat King, Tamara Litch, and BJ Leitcher, or Litcher, have a history of associating with hate groups and expressing racist and anti-immigrant sentiments. This could explain why the Freedom Convoy is strangely silent on labor issues facing immigrant truckers who now make up over one-third of truckers in Canada. Over half of truckers in major cities like Vancouver and Toronto are South Asian immigrants. And on that point, here we get to the actual issues facing truckers. So Uday Rana at the Globe and Mail reports that one in five truckers in Canada is South Asian, with large concentrations in Vancouver and the greater Toronto area, particularly in Brampton. South Asian drivers interviewed by Rana weren't concerned about vaccine mandates, but rather about wage theft, poor working conditions, and ensuring that their family members, often living in multi-generational households, don't become infected with COVID-19. It's weird we aren't hearing about this. One in five truckers, South Asian. This is a massive portion of truckers. But why aren't these issues being raised by the convoy? Because, again, it's not about the working class truckers. Uh, as research my co-authors and I published last year found, the trucking sector accounts for nearly 80% of the labor standards violations that workers reported to the federal government's labor program, which enforces the Canada Labor Code between 2006 and 2018. This level of law breaking is even more startling when you consider that only 17% of federally regulated employees work in trucking. Our research further discovered that small businesses with fewer than 100 employees accounted for 89% of labor standards violations between 2006 and 2018, even though these smaller firms employ only 13% of workers in the federal jurisdiction. 
In short, if you're asking who is far and away most likely to break the law and systematically violate workers' rights in Canada's federal jurisdiction, the answer is small trucking firms. And that is, by the way, who you are seeing appear at this convoy is a lot of these these owners, these small trucking firms, the owners of these these firms. So you see here, there's actually a great thread. Um, I'll link to this below as well, but this guy goes on and on and on, <laughs> all the examples. So, you know, calls out Transport XLR here, calls them uh, not a working class Joe, a capitalist enterprise. And it's the same thing again and again. Andy Transport, not a working class Joe, capitalist enterprise, not a working class Joe, capitalist enterprise, again and again and again, same thing. So that's who you are seeing appear here, not the workers that are being um, impacted by the lack of regulation and labor standards or the impact of COVID-19 on their families. No, you're seeing the capitalists at these uh, at this convoy pretending to be working class and having people like Tucker Carlson out there selling this off as a working class uproar. Now, a few last things. So Anti-Hate Network, I shared this in the last video, but just quickly, the Freedom Convoy is nothing but a vehicle for the far right, so this still stands. You can check out this article, and it references a lot of the things that I mentioned earlier um, in regards to uh, some of the organizers behind this convoy. Uh, as well, this from Caroline Or Bueno. So this is someone who's done a lot of research into the far right over the last six years and how they have used various issues to try and recruit people. So she writes here, this dynamic is still very much what's playing out now. A few years ago, the far right in Canada was using issues related to oil and gas as cover for their movement. Today, the issue is vaccines and lockdowns, masks, etc., which has far broader appeal among the public. And just quickly on the issue of oil and gas. The right wing defense or phony defense of the working class in oil and gas is just a defense of the owners of the oil and gas industry. So the reason why it's been largely successful is because there has not been a proper left uh, movement against it. Meanwhile, at least in Canada, in the U.S., you do have people like Bernie Sanders, who in his platform while, while running for president discussed, yes, of course, the need to move away from fossil fuels into renewable energies. But in that process, had a clear line about how he would take care of of the working class in the oil and gas industry, full pay for five years, including job retraining and retirement if you are near retirement age. So there are, you know, those kinds of plans out there, though they are, it, it definitely doesn't have the same kind of, you know, momentum or or platform that um, the right has been able to uh, uh, use in terms of their ability to try and get these sorts of people on board with them. But last point here. so. Again, Caroline Orr says, uh, I wrote about the anti-vaccine movement in Canada and its ties to Bannon, Flynn, the PPC, Christian nationalism, and the global far-right movement and why things could escalate after Monday's election. This is back after the last election in September. So again, somebody who's been very intertwined with uh, this sort of reporting understands how they utilize these various movements, be it oil and gas, be it this anti-mandate, anti-vax uh, sentiment, how they use these sorts of issues to try and recruit to their far-right opinions.